You are listening to Missed Apex Podcast. We live F1. Welcome to Missed Apex Podcast Midweek. I am your host, Richard Reddy, but my friends call me Spanners, so let's be friends. I'm joined by my most regular friend, Matt Two Rumpets. Hello, Matt. Hey there. Good to see you. Okay, so this is a reaction to the Dutch pancake intro, isn't it? Then you've then done a really boring intro. Well, the problem here is I've already done my Dutch intro. I was like, well, I could talk about getting sand out of my shoes, but then I was like, no, that would just send you into a tailspin. What would sand have to do with, with Holland? Zandvoort, it's very oh. sandy there. You got to clean the racing surface off. You know, it's, it's, it's like on a beach, basically. Okay, and this is why I'm glad we've got an expert guest and not someone who seems determined to dismantle this project. Now, Matt, you are really, really keen on the, the strategy side. And, and I just, I love the sporting side as well. And I I know people kind of groan where, including me, when you go on about tyres, but that quite deliberately is how F1 has set itself up for the strategy. So most of the time when we're talking about tyres, we are just talking about the gaming of the strategy. Well, yeah, uh, the the pit stops, when they happen, how you manage them. And and they're just sort of, um, I'll use the fancy word proxy for a lot of the other stuff that teams do with regards to their setup, mechanical and aerodynamic as well. They're an easy way to sort of track who's got it right and who's got it wrong. And uh, yeah, it is. It's super high stakes poker at extremely high speeds. And I love it. Yeah. And so we had last week, we were arguing about Kyle Larson's claim that he was better than Max Verstappen, but it's not Max yeah. Verstappen that wins the race or Valtteri Bottas or Juan Pablo Montoya. It's strategists like Mike Caulfield, formerly of uh, Mercedes and Haas. Hello, Mike. Hey, mate. Um, yeah, it's good to be back. Nice intro, that as well. Um, <laughs> but I take I'm not allowed to talk about street waffles then, if pancakes uh, are If you counts. have a really strong opinion about waffles, can you just get it out of the way first, up top? But you're not in Zandvoort, so... No, it so I miss out on it, unfortunately. Yeah, hopefully someone... I'm in, I'm in Monza next week, so hopefully someone will carry some over from Zandvoort this weekend and pass them on. Have you managed to get to any of these tracks as a fan, or have you only worked at them? Uh, last time I was at a fan was 2008, I think it was. Was that um, was that between employments, or that before? Was in, that 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 was between employments. Yes, that was um, while well, I was still at university. Um, so that was the last time I was at a fan. I'm not entirely sure I could probably go as a fan these days. I don't know. I feel I'd feel I'm I'm missing too much information, or need to get involved, or need to. Yeah, I think I'd struggle um, to actually go to a circuit as a fan. So I'm not, all, I'm not giving anything away, but although you are not currently working for a team, you are very much still in the F1 strategy space. So can you can you watch it from a racing point of view without putting your strategic fingers and eyes over everything? Not really. No, I it, again, it's one of those ones. If I'm just at home watching on TV. So when I first left Haas, I very much was watching on TV, no data, no income in, and I really struggled because. I couldn't follow what was going on because the graphics weren't good enough or what wasn't being said <laughs> wasn't good enough. So I was getting frustrated there and I'm now in a better position where I at least have all the data now in a race when I'm watching on TV and yeah, being at a track, I'm still the same. I, <laughs> I watch squiggly lines and track maps and little timing screens rather than the actual video of it mainly. Occasionally, if something exciting is happening, I will then watch what's going on but um yeah more often than not I'm, I'm anticipating that overtake to come and watching the trace get closer and closer together and then watching it on the track map as it passes rather than watching the tv and yeah that's yeah just... so, so you end up like the matrix watching the ones and zeros going down going oh that's the lady in the red dress so i wonder how you react to race commentary so i've only i've had to watch a few races recently where i haven't had any commentary and i, I love the comms uh, i think it adds to the excitement but but when you're working with the teams do you ever have somebody just like keeping an eye on the Sky broadcast and going, oh, hang on a minute, uh, Kravitz has just said a really interesting thing here. Maybe we should use that information. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's yes and no. As in, so back in the Mercedes days, they were obviously covering every every bit of footage they could do. So back in the race control room, um, 
the, the Sky footage would be on. So if something was mentioned on there, it would be written on the on as a chat to kind of say, all right, this has been mentioned, and someone would more than likely already be looking into it. But it's just kind of an idea just to make sure someone is aware of it. Um, yeah, and then has they someone again potentially is either listening to the Five Live commentary or the Sky commentary, and would just kind of say they're saying this is happening, and you go, no, 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 it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, um, but but yeah, so there is someone like generally if someone a lot of the roles by the Sunday have I have actually got. Um, there's more more obviously involved in the race and you can't do any no more to kind of set up so other than kind of your race engineer and your performance engineer controls engineer who are directly related to the cars some of your other engineers who are at the track like your your kind of reliability or all those aspects don't actually have any work to do during the race maybe a bit of monitoring of a few telemetry but they kind of put on kind of what we call competitor analysis. So they'll be looking to listening to competitor ah. radio or listening to sky commentary or listening to that just to, just to kind of like pass that extra bit of info in. So it's just a bit of that kind of split of roles where, where you can, when you free up a bit of resource on a, on a race weekend. Ah. Yeah. I just, I wonder from that expert point of view, if you can even enjoy the commentary because, <laughs> because they're there to provide, you know, a narrative and entertainment. It isn't actually their job to accurately predict things but whereas we can just absorb that, it must be quite frustrating for for team members. Yeah, yeah, I think it. I, I mean, yeah, it it is. It's there's there's some things which you kind of, I'd say, I'd shout at the screen and kind of go, "No, why are you saying that? Don't say that." Oh man, I get more frustrated when they're saying wrong things and they're saying it as fact rather than kind of saying trying to kind of give a little bit of insight into the race. That that's what really kind of is like. It was one of my ticks, basically, in that, in that sense. Where I have to just try and restrain myself and and look where I am before I start shouting <laughs> expletives at the screen. So, so for example, if we were in to invite you onto a live Miss Apex watch along, for example, if you, you'd have to watch your expletives there. No, no, I, th- I think that'd be a very knowledgeable um, experience in 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 that sense. Let's no, do sorry, that. It, we should do that. <laughs> I would I'd quite like that. It'd be quite interesting to be honest. But yeah. And also I, I feel sometimes I can I can add a little bit in that sense where I don't, I don't mind them getting things wrong, but it's when they kind of just say it's as fact and it's just like, where have you got information for? You're just guessing. Oh, oh right. So um guessing with an unearned authority, which is I am an absolute <laughs> I am an absolute expert in doing that. This plan has to happen and I think it actually has to happen in a pub mic. Leave it with me, I'll make arrangements, Matt. I love it. I was just going to add in my personal pet peeve because I too am a fan of the track map and timing screen, adding the most usable context to your viewing and listening uh, experience. But the one that always gets me is they're like, oh my gosh, A is catching B, A is catching B. And you're looking at a track map and going, no, A has just caught a bunch of back markers and B has free air in front of them. Can we not jump to that conclusion just yet? That, that was just a personal experience, though, not a question. Yeah, no, I, I think I've seen that a few times as well. Yeah, that's the case of, oh, something's happened. He's lost two seconds over the last couple of laps. Yes, because he's had six cars to get his way through. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So the reason we've got you here today, Mike, is because I think we had a, a little bit of an idea in our heads that we haven't had a strategy corner for a while. And, you know, if you've got time after a block of three or four races uh, we can have a bit of a rundown of some of the key strategic moments that have happened but also i would like to use you if you don't mind first for some of those stupid questions you know like it's it's gone on so long like that i've never asked and now i feel stupid for asking them so just a little bit of strategy 101 if that's okay yeah no problem yeah so i think my the first question i had is actually checking the things that I say with an unearned authority. So I'm always talking about this perceived difference between setting up for qualifying and setting up for the race. And in my mind, some drivers have the race in mind. I don't quite know how they they do that. And uh, and then that would depend on a track, whether the, the track's track position is super important um, or, or whether they've got weather conditions to consider. But like, for example, in my mind, Lewis Hamilton doesn't care about qualifying runs a bit more uh, wing or less wing, whichever way around it is, because he's focused on tyre preservation on a Sunday. So my first question is, Mike, is, is this a real phenomenon where some drivers or teams might set up more for a race or more for qualifying? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's 100% a thing. Um, 
we even do analysis or sorry i used to do analysis and i'm pretty sure teams still do it where you do kind of a a bit of a crossover in terms of quality pace versus race pace and to see what is the benefit i mean you made the point there say somewhere at monaco obviously the the criteria of that one is qualifying because you can be three seconds slower in the race but not be overtaken so that is the very extreme scenario in that one where you need to get your qualifying car set up correctly and and you'll hopefully do well from that there's other races obviously which um come to the point where you need still that good track position but overtaking is a bit more possible so you need to start getting that balance right between the two and going into it you do that comparison of what what do i need in terms of race pace what do i need in terms of qualifying pace i think Haas is the prime example last year um where they were very strong qualifying but the race totally dropped off and that wasn't just a compromise between their quality and race pace there was something obviously fundamentally wrong with the car when they went into long stints and the, and the tire degradation but that was also helping them in that qualifying preparation because they were able to get the heat into the tires accidentally <laughs> Almost and, then. yeah accidentally but and 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 get that that one lap nailed really to with the, all, everything in the window so so yeah. i just i just wonder if i've got a bit of a simplistic kind of grasp on it yeah. where um sometimes like if the teams can fire their tires up it means that might be better over one lap, but then they suffer in the race. So there was a weird one at Austria this year with the sprint race, where in the sprint race, uh, the qualifying was pretty close. And then, um, but then Verstappen looked a bit stronger in the race. I think if I'm remembering correctly, then in the actual race qualifying, Verstappen was suddenly like half a second ahead, but actually ended up struggling in the race and Norris was able to catch up with him. So is that kind of, you find yourself, you know, they've made a setup tweak and and that's kind of led them in that direction and they might not necessarily have wanted that yeah potentially so i think with the sprint race and the sprint qualifying i'm just trying to remember the order of everything goes now so qualifying is in the correct place now isn't it yeah so yeah you get the, you get right the sprint quality you get a good performance and then you get the sprint race to get your first idea of the long run performance so potentially after that sprint race they thought oh okay maybe something's a little bit we're not happy with it. We're going to make a tweak between the sprint race and qualifying, which has then they've maybe thought they had a bit more margin than they did. So got that improved qualifying pace and then actually the race comes. And then I think what a lot of people don't maybe comprehend is how much the, the track temperature and that track actually makes their effect as well on, on these types of degradation and tire warm up and anything. So, I mean, even something in the region of just five degrees track temp can make your tires not working for a quality lap to being perfectly in the window. Cause you'll obviously try, you have your out lap. Austria is obviously a short lap anyway to get your tire temperatures. So you've got to try and do all your work. You've got to manage the traffic in that, uh, in that space as well. And just basically start in the lap at a reasonable temperature because the tire temperature is going to grow over that one quality lap. So somewhere like Barcelona, or at least it used to be, where you had to try and manage sector one so it didn't fall apart in sector three. Um, And it's still a little bit the case now, but not as much because they've changed the layout in sector three, but that's still the the case. Um, So there's all those ideas that you need to go into it. What point do you want your ideal? Do you want to start out the window so you maybe struggle into turn one, but you're good by the end of the lap and just trying to get that balance. And a lot of it, I wouldn't say it's guesswork, but it's it's... That's what the practice sessions are for, trying to say, right, where, where do we need to be roughly in that bit? Again, what compound you have in terms of tyre depends on how wide that working window is as well. So like the harder compounds generally have that little bit of a wider window, whereas you go to C5, um, the the softest compound, and that can be really on a knife edge. Um, so you could quickly get out of that and lose a lot of time. And then when you come to the race as well, um, yeah, you, you'll fall apart on there. And obviously... The other one is that in the race and qualifying, more often than not now, you use a different compound. So what might get you in the window for the qualifying might struggle to get you into the the window for the race. So you're actually trying to set yourself up for the race, which pushes you a little bit over the qualifying threshold as such. Right. I'd like to quickly ask, uh, as part of that, as a strategist, one of the things I've noticed is that the cars, different cars will be better at different parts of the circuit. And my question to you, is that wholly a performance engineer driven decision, or do they sort of consult with you and say, well, we could have the car faster here. We could have the car faster there from a strategy point of view. Is there one that's better than the other? 
So I think in terms of actual places on the track where, where the performance gains, so high speed, medium speed, low speed, that's usually more of a fundamental of, of, of the car. Um, so it's not really a say the, the strategist, the strategist is a bit more global kind of saying, we want this performance over a, a lap and we want this pace. We need this kind of race pace, for example. Um, we can give a bit of an idea of, of kind of where people stand in terms of where's our high speed performance, where's our low speed performance, where's our medium speed performance in terms to compared to competitors. And that's really where the strategist comes in to say, right, who's our closest competitor? What's their performance like on these type of circuits and try and go forward. So we go into a, so the team would go into a race saying, okay, we know this might be a slightly weaker one for us. Um, and we might be losing out to say Alpine in this race compared to beating them last weekend. But we also might be better than the 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 RBs in, in in this one. So you kind of try and balance it, and you also try and look at say, well, okay, can we give away a bit of so Spa's the Spa's probably maybe a little bit of an outlier compared to um to other circuits where you do have this very much a right. Do I go for a low downforce or slightly higher downforce? And there is quite a big shift in terms of some people choose one direction, some people choose the others. And that's maybe sometimes where you get the strategist a bit more say into it. And again, they won't make the final decision, but they'll kind of be looking at what teams are doing. And especially when you come to practice, they'll be looking and saying, okay, look at these speed traces, look at these um, sector times, right? We can see this is the direction people are heading and this is where we can go. I mean, everyone can see it eventually, but that's kind of the strategy's job to kind of highlight more people have gone in this direction and this is the result of it we maybe need to think, and this is where you pass it on to the race engineers and performance engineers to say, right, let's run that through our sims. Does it align with what our sims say? Or is there something which hasn't kind of played out in, in that respect? That's interesting. So actually, but my next thing on the list was for the for the 101s was wing choice. So obviously, when we go to Monza, your, your hand is forced. You've got to basically rip the wings off as much as you can. Uh, but how much does the strategist get involved in that in that kind of actual downforce choice because you, you always hear the discussions between the drivers like oh do you want to click more front wing but i'm assuming that's much more within a much more narrow margin the big decisions have already been made so do you ever get on them and go look we actually do need a bit more downforce here or or i think i think you should be running higher wing than you are yeah i mean i don't think it's ever a point where strategists will say we should be running more wing but it's the strategist's job to say right, this is what people are doing, this is where we're sitting, this is where we're sitting in kind of the speed trap, and this is where we're sitting in terms of lap times, and then you get the speed traces up, you can see your, de your deficit to people. So you can quite clearly see now with the GPS and and everything that's available to teams, you say, okay, we're gaining two temps over the straights, but we're losing eight temps over, over around the corners. And then that's when you raise the conversation with the race engineers and performance engineers who've got all the sim tools to say, okay, if we went to our next wing level, what do we gain on our car? Because it's not a like for like people's wings gain you different results in like the the coring performance might slightly improve, but it might not improve by the eight times you're missing, for example, because that car just gen generates, has a better car setup. But you can kind of say, yeah, we're in the wrong place here. We're struggling. We need to make a, a, a change in setup here when we're not where we should be. Oh, that's brilliant. I, lo I love it because we started off talking about um, qualifying versus race pace and it ended up there, which I absolutely love. But I do want to, can I, can I swing back around to, to my quali versus race pace? And uh, I have some ideas in my head, particularly around, say, Lewis Hamilton, who I think he does, fa see, it always seems to be much stronger on race pace than he is in qualifying. And it's been like that for a while. So you were at Mercedes with... Rosberg versus Hamilton. And I know 20, 2012, uh, 2015, I'll never forget the look on Rosberg's face as he got handed the qualifiers trophy. There used to be a trophy for the best qualifier of the year. And I've never seen anyone like not want a trophy more than he didn't want that trophy. Uh, but it almost seemed like Hamilton conceded qualifying that year. Yeah, I mean, I'm going back 2015. I'm trying to remember the exact. The, I remember that bit about Rosberg. Yeah, that's that's definitely <laughs> the case. He was not. He, he did not class that as a win whatsoever. He was, you know, not impressed. Um, that's just not his mentality. But yeah, um, I think Lewis. I mean, he's obviously got the record for amount of pole positions. So I, I, I think know that's why I always bit, sound stupid when I say it. Bit, bit disingenuous to say he's not bothered about qualifying. But um, yeah, I, it's it's. 
I think me potentially is he's got a little bit, and I don't want to say older because he's he's younger than me, but um, he's, 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 as he's going on in his career, he understands a bit more. And I think there's times as well, especially in the different kind of stages in his career where at the moment he knows he's not going to get pole position or at least earlier on in the season, last season, he wasn't going to get pole position. So I think he's very much at the kind of maturity now to say, okay, we need to put our car in the best place for the race. And that also comes back. You'll you'll go through all the sims with your your engineers and your strategists and kind of go and say, okay, but if we're going this way, what's the kind of spread of the field? I think Mercedes were obviously at that point last year where they were at the bottom of the top end. So they could afford to lose a bit of qualifying pace and not lose any positions. Whereas then when you're starting to get up now in the mix where it's Red Bull, Ferrari, McLaren, Mercedes all fighting, you've now got the potential from going from P1, P2, P3 down to P7, P8, which is then obviously a lot of, lo- 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 lot more difficult to come through on a, on, a, on a Sunday. So I think he very much kind of views the whole picture of like where are we at, what's our likelihood with our best qualifying performance and what's our likelihood with, um, if, we, if we don't make these changes now there's a, maybe a sniff of kind of pole position in that respect. He, I, I'd fully expect him to maybe start swinging a bit more towards qualifying. But the, the margins are so fine these days I as know. well. And because because the car paces between all teams are now so similar, as in the spread from, I mean, first to 20, it's almost the second. So the top ones are all split within kind of three temps in terms of race pace. That pace isn't enough for overtaking to happen anymore. So it's not like you can qualify down in P7 and come through the field. There just isn't the pace in the car to do that. So qualifying pace is starting to swing back, but it is important to qualify in a good position as long as you don't sacrifice that and destroy your tires, basically. That's interesting because we did go through a a phase where we were here, we were talking about how qualifying had just become less and less interesting over time. And it is just starting to chew back now towards the end of this regulation set. But I still get the feeling in my head that for whatever reason, Hamilton has this difference between race pace, qualifying pace, and Russell seems to have the opposite, which is why in my head I was like, this must come down to somewhat to to choice and approach to the weekend. So when they got the front row lockout, is it was Silverstone, wasn't it? And it was um, Russell P1, Hamilton P2. And I looked at that grid and I went, There's, Russell's got no chance. Like This is classic Hamilton territory. And sure enough, he got past him in, um, in the first stint. Yeah, I... Uh... Um, I don't, I, it's hard to say. It's hard to say without the kind of actually guess knowledge. Like, You're on guess, the yeah, just guess. You're on yeah, the I mean, I, I, I'm, I think I'm going to slightly disagree with you. I don't think that they. Like, it could just purely be a driving style aspect. I don't think it's a setup choice. I don't think it's a. I'm going to favour qualifying over race. I think it's maybe just for with the current regs, the current way the cars are set up, the current tyres, and the way the Mercedes deals with it. Lewis's driving style or Lewis's kind of profile just edges himself that bit more to a race situation, whereas George is able to get that little bit more out the tyres in a qualifying situation. And it's not through like a triumph for Lewis. I think it's just the way they drive it and the way they kind of potentially how George sets up his car different to Lewis just to suit their driving styles itself, potentially. And but and and this is guessing. I could be totally wrong in that, but the, what we is, do here. I've seen it in the past. <laughs> That's what we do here, Matt. Uh- <laughs> was that like a truck or a fire engine in the background look it's part of the show you know you live in the cent- he lives in madison square it sounded like a train going by but uh i i digress i did read a comment i believe from andrew shovelin uh that under this regulation set he expressed the idea that lewis couldn't fully uh use his braking performance under this regulation set and that sounds very similar to me to sort of that driver style comment that you made. But I want to I want to go on to uh, ask a further question then, because you're at a team like Mercedes where your drivers have equality. You're having to pick a strategy that caters to people who do different things better than the other. How much of a compromise do you make each direction then sort of sort of based on that? Well, here we have the one driver can qualify better. So I can think about a strategy for someone who can qualify between two and four. But then I have someone who can manage a heavy car better late in the first stint, but is only going to qualify between four and six. Seems like to me that might be a bit of a challenge. That's a good question, Matt. You were due, to be fair. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a really difficult situation to try and manage. And I think... 
I think the 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 way it is though is that you can, at the moment you can't go into a race weekend knowing that you're going to be top three. So you, with the performance of McLaren and Red Bull and Ferrari on that way, so even saying I've got a car which is going to qualify better, you still might have them seven and eight, and you might have them first and seventh. It, we we you just don't know. So obviously going into the race weekend, the strategists will do lots of sims and we'll do lots of kind of split splits on that to kind of say right. This is what our kind of differences between our qualifying positions. These are our differences between race paces. So you put what's called a base lap time in for each cars, and it'll come out with what the um, optimum strategies are for that one. And you'll still try and obviously manage each card the best they can do. Um, George, it's always tough. Will, yeah, it's. It. I mean, it's it's George. If George qualifies higher, you'll try and. You'll try and get him the, the the best one he can, but you'll may also go into it with all your sims with maybe him a tenth, tenth and a half slower than Lewis and see how that kind of causes that interaction. But I think it's the back to the comment I made when I, I was listening back to the Mercedes podcast this morning um, on what we did. And they'll still be the same. It's still all about equality and it's all about the best result for the team. So they'll try and make it so they don't hinder each other. And if, they, if that case is to the qualifying second and third or second and fourth, whatever, um, but they'll try and make it so they're maximizing the points from it. And and once you get the, obviously the qualifying performance, you can then you can then make that happen and say, right, this is what we've got, this is what we've seen. But the like I said, the gaps are so different, so so small now in terms of the the split between the cars. You're not like you're looking at half a second between the cars. You're still only yeah. looking at a tenth, tenth and a half, and you may be looking for potentially George can take the tires that little bit longer or Lewis can take those tires a little bit longer or Lewis is slightly better on a softer compound than George's or vice versa. So again, you kind of program that all oh, in man. and say, well, what's the best for it? But we need to make sure this team result is maximized. So I, I just, I love that, that we're going to turn up at Zandvoort and Monza. And actually we, we don't know. And they're two completely different tracks. So we actually, we don't know what the order is going to be probably between the top three. You could be generous and say, you know, there's eight cars that could win both races. Uh, Perez doesn't look like winning a race. Although, they did say Perez has come back refreshed and revitalised um, after the summer break. So maybe maybe this time. But, you know, four teams all have a chance of having a, a race-winning car in those weekends. It's amazing. Um, but this brings us very neatly onto why we got you on here in the first place, um, is to look back at some of the strategy stuff from the season. And now the, the Mercedes one is interesting because when you were there... It was all very much about, no, we, we don't give you that strange, weird tactic. You know, we it's the same tactics, priority goes to the car in front, all very fair, very fair. That seemed to go out of the window in Spa when they gave Russell a quote-unquote race-winning strategy because obviously he was underweight at the end of the race. Um, I w I'm really fascinated to see your take of how how that went down. O almost more interesting to, to pretend he didn't get disqualified and say... You know what? What on earth is going on there? And so this is it is actually very similar to when when I was there. We we would have had that as an option for the second driver, um, because I think everyone, everything I read, everything going into it, which I was a little bit surprised about actually going into the race, was saying it's a two stop, and certain people even saying, oh, it might be a two slash three stop, which at Spa is always a is is it was a strange one from my eyes. Is it? Why is that? Why? Because it's low wear. Yeah, it's 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 just it's a low wear and it's it's a it's a long lap as well. So it's you kind of you've you've only got certain places you can overtake and you've got minimal times you can actually do it. And it's low wear and it's always been a case of yeah, it's the tires generally hang on and the tires are generally pretty decent there. Um, yes, in the Friday of Spa this weekend, the, the last weekend, it was showing higher degradation, but. What people seem to fail to take into account of it is that a lot of the track had been resurfaced and also there was very weather dependent in in that respect um so yeah i, I going into race i thought it was a two stop hearing the people saying it was a three stop was was surprising um but there's always that scenario where a one stop could happen and the one stop wasn't the optimum strategy um which is why i did have allowed russell to go on it um and and see what he could have done because Russell was down in obviously he was down in P six I think six P five yeah. P six yeah at that point so I mean I think they very much expected him to go onto it and then finish P three P four 
I think probably their their predictions were showing that was Lewis coming through, overtaking, McLaren coming through, overtaking, Verstappen and 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 that bit. And maybe not finishing like worst case would be finishing where he ended up without doing it. Two stop at best, he's going to finish P6 because he's just mirroring what everyone else has done. So it's that opportunity to see, right, how we can get more points for the team. Um, and I think it just played out that the teams didn't really, un- well, not understand because they clearly understand as well a lot of clever people. But Spa is notorious for they've got this new track surface, which has been rubbered in a little bit. We've had a lot of weather over the weekend, so that rubber again helps it. And that hard tyre is generally pretty resistant. So it was a bit warmer on the um, Sunday, I believe, than it was earlier in the weekend, which again, everyone suddenly goes, oh, that'll cause more degradation. But not necessarily on that hard tyre because the energy going into that hard tyre, actually that increase in track, temp- in track temperature and air temperature potentially made that hard tyre work that little bit better as well. So if you just manage it at that early stage, it, 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 it lasts. Okay, I have two questions here. One of them is about the resurfacing, and I want to get back to that because I want to focus on what you're talking about right now because Mercedes came out, uh, and there was a lot of controversy. People were like, oh. But if you look at what they said to a person, they were like, no, nope, we ran every model we could. George should have finished in exactly the same place. We just gave him a strategy he was happier with. And then he winds up winning. And... uh putting this whole egalitarian look into optical crisis, because I don't think it's really changed at all at Mercedes in the slightest. What I want to ask about, though, is it seems to me, because we were just talking about low downforce versus high downforce at Spa, and always the low downforce package into the Kimmel straight, that's where your passing point is. But they changed the DRS zones, and it absolutely negated that. And it seems to me every team that went low downforce completely missed that it wasn't going to work the way it used in the past. How, how does that piece of information not get picked up in, in uh, working out your strategies? Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it was so much the, the overtaking part of it. And from what I saw, it was more actually on the Friday, was what the teams who went in with a low downforce were really struggling in sector two. And this could, again, going back to the resurfacing, could be that kind of interaction with the new surface, the low downforce, we're causing just an amount of lap time which was um which just wasn't being retained. Um so the high downforce obviously you then get the DRS effect um in in qualifying and and those low fuel runs. But the teams which are in the low downforce obviously don't get as big DRS effects, but they were losing out so big in the in the kind of sector two in, in that bit, which is what you expect, obviously, with that difference, but I think the gap this year was bigger. Um due to that resurfacing than, than than what we've seen in previous seasons, which meant people then went, ah, actually, we can run that bit more downforce in that one. But like you said, that then has that knock-on effect there when you're running the higher downforce, but the overtaking, the DRS zones have been shortened, the overtaking then becomes that little bit more difficult. But as a rule for F1 teams, you generally look at the overtaking. I mean, you kind of go, it's it's a bob out figure. It's all very much, it's it's... It's a science. I've never met anyone who's very happy with an overtaking model, but they can say, yes, an overtake is <laughs> definitely going to happen in this spot. Right. Where everyone struggles to get it down to a T. What going to happen? And it's a, it's an ongoing thing. Um, and in all my years, no one's ever nailed it to say, I've got an overtaking model I'm really happy with. Um, so I don't think, and I think the Kemmel straight one, it was only shortened by 75 meters or something. So usually when that's that, that kind of length, you think, uh, it's a little bit less. It's it's not not a lot, um, but I think the combination of that and with people going to the higher downforce wings then just makes that tiny go over the edge, and it just makes that overtaking more difficult. And I go back to the point I make earlier as well that because the car's pace is so similar now, overtaking just is generally more difficult because you don't get that natural car pace and you don't get that natural kind of delta in in performance. So you can get in cornering performance where there's basically it's that. For, for Spa, it's actually that exit off turn one. And uh, uh, if you get the poor exit off turn one, it doesn't matter how fast you are on that DRS zone, you, you, you're still not going to overtake there. Um, okay, yeah, because you're just, you're basically pinning the throttle from the exit all the way to the uh, braking zone. Um, about the resurfacing. Yeah, I knew this, it. I knew this you were going to do this. Question now. You were going to go I'm, from really interesting racy stuff to, now let's talk about tarmac. Every, right, I give up. Over to you. Yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. Now, now I, I, I want to talk to you about the <laughs> aggregate um, and how you measure it. Are you using laser scans? Are you using, never mind. No, that's not really my question because I already scans. know how that's done. Um, I want to ask as a strategist, when you go to a track that's got that much new asphalt, do you get to tell the, the people who are planning the runs for the free practices, do you get to say, I need this kind of information? Like, do you get to get in on saying, you know, we're going to need 10 laps with this setup. We're going to need, you know, to compare this to that. Or is that still, again, just mainly your performance engineers trying to get the fastest car possible? No, no. So that's that's very much in the strategies strategists wheelhouse. That one. Um, it's a case of, I mean, less less so now, but in the past where we could choose how many compounds you'd have of each type. So it was going in, and people didn't have the yeah. set two, three, eight, um, and med- so I had hard, medium, and soft. You'd go into it saying, right, this is what our free practice program would be. We want to test this compound. We want to test this compound. So we need to bring this many to make sure we're covered for the race, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and yeah, and then you'd look into this because you have obviously all this detail of what has been changed. So if you know the track res- has been resurfaced and if it's been significantly resurfaced, you know there's going to be a difference in terms of degradation compared to previous seasons. So you can't no longer use historic data and looking at current season data to try and kind of map it out. You're like, I'm a bit of an unknown here. You get some scans from Pirelli to say, this is how the surface has changed. Um, so you can try and look to say, right, this surface is like, this other circuit so we can maybe see how that affects it but again it depends where what type of circuit it is is it a high speed one is it a low speed one where has the resurfacing taken place so really you need that running in free practice so yes to answer your question the strategist will then say i really need some running on this compound and this compound you don't need on all compounds but generally you need x amount of laps on it generally at high fuel because i will need to see that and then you can generally transfer what that performance was to Ooh, to the other compounds on, as well hang on generally at high fuel so earlier you made a point about you know the the running on uh, on a friday you know and you go okay well we need to go in a different direction one of our favorite games is the amateur friday strategist where we're, we're trying to pick apart the order of the teams from friday and and you sort of go oh hang on Red Bull are looking competitive here. Mercedes are looking competitive there. And then you'll get, I don't know, like an RB from the back of the grid suddenly in P2 and you go, oh, all those times are worthless. <laughs> so do, is there any little clues we can look at to go, oh, no, that is a high fuel run? Because that's our yes. first clue. So I maybe mean, those reconnaissance laps. Yeah, I mean, so generally on your Friday running, the the, the, the thing you mainly got to look for, everyone will generally do the same kind of run profile, but obviously sometimes they'll use different, compounds which makes that a little bit difficult p1's always a bit of a side so p1 is that that case of right i've come into the race with our sims and we're going this initial setup and you're just trying to get into that kind of window is this car feeling right the track's always green it's usually in an unrepresentative condition so you don't generally use p1 as a as a as a performance based session you you'll be trying to get the car closer and closer but no one's going flat out um, which is why if anyone ever crashes in P1, you kind of always question what they're actually doing because it's not the place for, for, for that, really. Once you get to P2, you have obviously have two compounds there and you'll use a run on the first one. You'll, you'll use the harder one generally first. You'll go to then your softer compound um, to do your qualifying sims um, and then you'll go to a high fuel run. Usually when this turns around is for if there's a red flag or if there's something interrupted for you've 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 come out and you've or you've hit traffic or or that aspect. So the the ones which are difficult to see if you haven't got the full time in data and aspects is how many attempts have they had? What have they set the fastest lap on? Is it the first lap? Is it the third lap? And there's a lot of tracks where the softest compound is very much a lap one tire and you lose a hell of a lot of performance if it goes down to lap three or lap five, for example. Um, but then the next one is, is, is what, what point in the session did they set it? Does you have some cars go out a lot earlier than other cars, which is why you can never get that direct comparison to say a qualifying session because everyone runs at the same time and generally set it at the same point. Whereas in practice, you might have someone in the soft run 20 minutes into the session and someone else doing it 40 minutes into the session. And it's amazing how much that 20 minutes can make quite a bit of difference to the track um so so yeah it's mm. it's all about looking at that one and then the final one which is the, always the most difficult one to pin down is what engine mode people are running um mm. and you, you'll you'll often get 
some teams run in higher engine modes than others. Um, why? And it's, why though? What's the benefit of doing that? It's usually a consistency thing. So, so basically, if the engine manufacturer can say, "Yeah, we're happy for you to run this. We don't see this as reliability risk. We like this," and then you're trying to compare your own data. So you running a higher engine mode, and you've always run a higher engine mode, and in this session you want to put your breaking points and all that. So you want you to be as close to qualifying without being giving everything away. So often, like you gave the example, the ERBs, they potentially are running that little bit of a higher engine mode, so which is why you see them pop up there. Whereas your Red Bulls or your Mercedes, for example, may be running that bit lower because they're actually trying to do a slightly different program. Uh, interesting. Okay, so yeah. So that, how how good would you rate yourself at picking out the race order from friday practice like if we were sat doing a fp1 you know could you sit there and go oh hang on a minute looking at that looking at that ferrari it's looking a bit cumbersome and it's looking like it's in a low power mode that, that's going to be a peach come sunday uh fp1 i'm going to say no fp2 i'm pretty confident <sighs> if i can pick it out based on the, the can... i mean there's a lot of things still which can be difficult on it to pick out, but you, you generally start getting a good idea of where teams are going to sit on C FP2. Can I bug you then after FP2? And we'll do, and we'll tweet out some Caulfield predictions. <laughs> yeah, no nice. So how do you, how does a team, not how do you, because like I, I can sit there and look at, oh, you know, they strapped on the hard tire. There's Verstappen's times. He's on his fifth lap and on this tire it's 10 laps old and oh look there's hamilton on the same tire and roughly the same age and you can you can say oh well, hamilton's three tenths slower on this lap he's a little bit faster next you can get an idea of are they in the ballpark or not without any of the specialized knowledge how do the teams go about determining what power modes what engine modes the other cars are running how do they analyze that so you you obviously have the datum point for yourself in terms of this is the engine mode we're running and this is this is this is where where we sit and this is our step we make from this race to this race. You have what your other you don't know what engine modes your other engine partners are running. So for example, Haas don't know what Ferrari are running or what Sauber are running, but they know what's available to those other teams because everyone's the same. So again, you can look at the kind of speed traces and look at that kind of okay, they're running the same as us, they're running the same as us, they're running a bit lower, they're running a bit higher. When it comes to other teams, so looking from a house point of view, say looking at Mercedes or looking at Red Bull, it's very much then you go back into patterns of looking at what people are doing. And you'll always find one lap, and this is the beauty of the GPS, you'll always find one lap where they have just switched it into a, a higher power mode. So you can then see, ah, absolutely, you can see what their speed difference is there. You can, you uh, can see it. They can change it. it from the garage. They can change it on the car. Oh, right. So and there's they... literally people, oh my God, this is really 4D chess, isn't it? So there's people sitting there going, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. They've sneaked in a high power lap. And, and you'll often find, and, and the bigger teams, especially because they, you always try and hide what you can. So you don't want to give away what you can in the P2 bit. Um, so you, they won't run it on their um, their fastest lap they'll run it on an in lap or something like that so you'll see them attacking sector one still on an in lap and you think oh hang on a minute he's suddenly a lot quicker than the straights and you'll find they've switched it to a, to, to an engine uh, the higher engine mode but once you get that data you can then see roughly what range they're in again you compare it to their their engine partners so you can see what for example yeah toro rosso rbs are running compared to red bull and you see rbs are running a lot higher so you know okay red bull still have that much to come I mean, it's the same with mercedes and aston martin so you, you, you do those cross comparisons and then you just look back through the seasons because I think I mentioned this on the previous podcast, teams are cre uh, creatures of habit. So they will generally do a very similar program week on week on yep. week. So they'll run this type of engine mode and then they'll go to this. So they'll generally make this step from P2 to P3 and this step from P3 to qualify. Uh, so, yeah. Never get excited about like an Alpine Friday uh, practice run is the sort of there's little things like that that we, we've seen um and we've seen like ferrari tend to look relatively better on a friday as well and then and then the final one is just purely fuel load on a friday as well so you'll get some teams who are running the full 110 kilos when they're doing a high fuel running but then you'll do other teams who are going well actually the tires i'm running here are 10 laps old so 10 lap old one run 
might be about lap 20 in the race. So actually, I want to run 80 kilos here instead to try and get a proper representative thing that my tires are 10 laps old and this is what weight I'll be in the race. But that 30 kilos there is a second a second of pace uh, in the race. So you're getting suddenly totally looking going, ooh, um, Alpine are looking really quick in this in this race in compared to Mercedes. So they, they must have figured it out, but no, they're just no. a very different fuel load. So I want to ask, so so it's not just sandbags or non-sandbags. You're talking about specific fuel matching to relative tire age based on is this first stent, second stent, or potentially third stent in a two-stop. But I have a question for you. As a strategist, is the most useful data or for tire degradation like that first stent fuel load on relatively fresh tires, or is it actually harder to take that um, and add your math to it and get to what you're going to be expecting, like at the end of a of a longer third stent, say, like like which way is easier to model the heaviest or the the end of the race? So for me, it's always the the heaviest. So I I'd, I'd prefer. My ideal scenario is always the running of 105, 110 kilos, and then you're running on a, a, a very a slightly unused, so a, a basically a qualifying set of tires where it's three laps. So you've had your out, out fast in, and then you're running it. The reason for this is P2, the track's still not at best. So you're looking at what the degradation is. And you already know at that point, though, I'm on a heavy fuel load. I'm on a tire which I'm likely to be running in the race because qualifying were not likely to do more than three laps. Um, if qualifying is going all, all, all correctly. So this is my worst case scenario. So I know that if my deck's this in P2, if anything, this is the worst it's going to be in the race, If but it's probably going to get better um, because we're probably going to be potentially going to be running this medium tire at a lighter fuel load. The track's going to be a bit rubbered in. Um, and yeah, and you generally see that little bit of degradation performance. Also, the final one too, which is really difficult for a strategist to um, to program in is... How are the drivers driving? And they never, even though you tell the drivers in a P2 high fuel long run to say, <laughs> right, we want to drive this as you drive in a race or with this level's managing, <laughs> they, they never it. do it. They never, they, they, ne they never drive it exactly how they drive it in a race. So again, there's always more you can find. They'll always drive it a little bit more that have harder than, than they would do in a race because they know they only have six, seven laps and they're not going to have a drop off or it's no consequence. Um, they don't do it liberally. It's just, it's just the way they do it. <laughs> I was almost going to ask, is this also like driver psychology, give them the worst possible case. So then they get in the race and they're like, Ooh, this is better. Now I can go do something. But I, I want to ask from a purely, uh, again, analytical point of view, are you asking for that because it's easier to deal with degradation that's less than you've predicted in terms of adjusting strategy? Or is that just a uh, you personal preference and each strategist might sort of have a different feel as to what makes them most comfortable. Yeah. I mean, I think I, I can't speak for other strategists. I mean, everyone I've worked with have tend to is who I've learned from and who we've worked on probably go the same way as I, I'm going, but there might be others who, who do something differently. Um, yeah. I, I always find it in terms of going into a race, you, you'll run a simulations going into a race. You'll always look for the, the your, um, your, extremes anyway you'll always look for okay we're going into this race and it's a two stop what degradation do i need to see for it to become a one stop or vice versa we're going into the race for it being a one stop if the degradation increases to this or we have to stop before this lap it becomes a two stop and you've always got those kind of caveats of of where you where you need to hit and where you need to aim and what needs to be there for a successful race um so that's why i tend to find it easy because if you go if you go in worst case extremes and you're looking, you're expecting less, um, it's easier to react in that sense. You know, right, we can actually push this, this a little bit longer. We're not suddenly going, oh, the degradation's much higher than expected. Right, we've quickly got to shake this up and we're pitting on lap seven where we're trying to get to lap 16. And, and then you're trying to do a lot of kind of calculations in your head because the pack's still kind of quite tight. So you're coming into a lot of traffic, whereas you're getting into the kind of lap 17 lap 20 point the pack spread out a little bit more you can start to to play it that little bit easier those first yeah five to ten laps of a race are, are difficult in the sense of there's no gaps to drop into so even if you're struggling with degradation you're going to drop Doesn't out matter. and then you're potentially yeah. going to hit a load of traffic and and the worst case scenario is you're having bad deg and no one else is having bad deg so then you come out and you're like 
oh, and now I can't overtake because I'm actually now running the same degradation they are anyway. So because we've really screwed something up, which was a bit of the Haas situation last year. Where, I was going to say, it sounds like a very lived experience you're describing. I mean, I, I it's exactly <laughs> what we experienced in 2019 as well. It's, yeah, it's, it's the case of you you have that degradation and you can't overtake and it's it's yeah it's it's frustrating because everyone else is easily able to match what you're doing uh right here's one of, i'm going to risk one of my stupid questions and I, f- I feel like it's gonna oh god okay how do you know what the tire deg is doing during a race it's tire deg's purely just um lap time degradation so that's, that's it we, we, and then yeah, you talk but- to the driver like are you being slow on purpose or yeah, I mean, it's just fuel corrected. So you you look and you can, if you can see their lap times just holding steady and holding steady, obviously when you fuel correct it, then it is actually showing a little bit of a drop. But you then know if, um, for example, you, you, you're you already telling the driver to whether to, he needs to manage or not going into a race. If you know you've got a tire you need to expect to manage, you'll, you'll give him some targets. And then once the race starts progressing, you then start looking at the profile and say, right, we need to be hitting these targets to either A, catch this car and potentially undercut, or B, prevent the undercut from the car behind us. So we need to yeah. build this kind of gap out. Um, but we don't want to take too much out of the tyres by trying to push to create a gap and then fall off by having to stop three fall ups earlier than, than we need to because we also need to wait till this gaggle of cars clears at the end, exit, exit at the pit window. So it's all that kind of balance in that sense. But yeah, you're basically looking at a lap time graph and you're just trying to compare your lap times to others. And what you want to see is as flat line as possible and not a line which is shooting off getting <laughs> half a second slower a lap. Well, I'm sure you watch all the, the lap times during a race as, as we do. And um, for example, like Silverstone, Hamilton's lap times were almost metronomic. It was like a, an AI until the final couple of laps when he you know starting to get the flag out and celebrating. Um, so one of the things that really amuses me there is so they're not always constantly talking to the, the driver. Sometimes he's just getting on with the lap times. But I do love it when like the, the race engineer will come on and go, okay, you know, time to push. And the driver's like, I, what do you mean? I, I am. I've been flat out for 10 laps. So sometimes I guess it's hard to to know what the driver's behavior and mindset is during those stints. Yeah, no, it is. And I I think that was one thing I always worked well with, um, with uh, especially uh, what, well, um, Hulkenberg's engineer currently, I worked well with him at that point. We We used to have a good relationship and be able to kind of say, I'm not going to ask him directly and say, are you pushing or can mm. you go faster? It's more of a case of how are you, you, you always ask, it always ask you if the, how are the tires? And that kind of <laughs> gives a good indication of, of, right. Is the drive, if they come back and saying, yeah, they feel good. It's generally a means for, yeah, I've, there's more in these tires. I've, I'm very happy where we're at at the moment. I can push this more. If they come back and say, no, these are struggling then you, you, you know they're already on the oh, limit man. and there's not much more the driver can do from that. It, it, but yeah, you try to avoid that kind of, right, can you go faster now, please? And it's like, I am going as fast as I can. It, it's like uh, offering, you know, you're supposed to offer your seat to a pregnant lady on the bus, but it can be high risk. That's uh, that's all I say. Actually, there was a recent clip, um, it go, it's on social media a lot, and it was um, Fisichella's engineer when he was Alonso's teammate. And the engineer's just going mad at him going, mate, you cannot be two seconds a lap slower then Fisichella, like, what are you doing? Get on with it, push. But you don't really hear that kind of language in, in F1. I don't know. Maybe the standards are, are higher now. Uh, go on, sorry, Matt, I've been bumping you. This is a very small detail, but a message I hear from engineers to drivers quite a lot is update tire status. What are they updating if you already have all this information and why are they updating? Is it like those elevator buttons they give you to push so you don't get impatient waiting for the doors to close? Yeah, so basically that one. So the, the, the final bit of information we don't have, so we can see what the degradation is, but the drivers get the best feel in terms of grip. So yeah, you might be able to see in a drop off, you might be able to see kind of it's, it's going so and so, but what that kind of question is is like really is what is the what is the how the tie is feeling for you whereas and most teams have a kind of one to five ranking on it so that's saying it's getting it's generally a switch on the steering wheel but they'll they'll switch it to, to try and not give it away to competitors to say yeah my tires are screwed i'm going to be pitting soon but so like that's where they say what are the tires and then the driver will come back it says a three and a three is generally what you're aiming to say oh great if it's a three or mid halfway through the stint it's exactly where we should be. It's it, that's fine. If they're saying it's a two, you go okay. We can 
generally push a bit more. And if they're saying it's a four, basically means right, we've got to start thinking about pit stop probably a bit earlier than than we're, we're uh... like it. So that's that's basically the kind of the 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 feeling on that is because the way the Pirelli tires work, you'll see the drop off in lap time, drop off in lap time, and then suddenly they'll just go. They'll they'll finally hit the cliff where that's it. There's there's no rubber, no usable rubber left on the tire, and that's when you hit this part where they just drop off and there's no grip. Um, so that's what you're trying to avoid. You're trying to avoid ever going into that bit and making the pit stop before. And the drivers can feel that because it is gradually getting worse and worse in terms of their grip levels. So what's happening when Hamilton is saying these tires are dead, man, and then he sets purples? Like what? That's a well-known meme that's, in F1. That's what's just happening? Lewis, isn't it? That's that's Lewis's psychology. He's, <laughs> he's always he's, he's he, he he says this because he knows he knows other people are listening to it, and he <laughs> he says it because he he. He tries to get people excited, and he tries, in terms of like, oh, okay, that's it. He, he hasn't got any more, but I'll I'll try and use my tires up a bit more because he hasn't got any tires left, and then he gets other cars to use it. I mean, we had it when I was with Mercedes. I can't remember what year it was. Probably sixteen, sixteen or fifteen. I can't remember. But Singapore, he kept on going back saying, "These tires now they're done, they're done, they're done," and like. We actually at that point bailed and pitted in front of a set of tires. Oh, then we no. looked at the and looked at the tires, and we're like. There's loads of rubber left on them, and so and, so, and the one thing that drivers do struggle with is is and this is generally more of a qualifying aspect or or uh, uh, not in a kind of a race as much. But if your tires aren't up to temperature, it gives them the same feeling as being over temperature because it's basically a grip ah, level like on a bell curve. So sometimes they'll think these tires are overheating, but actually it's the opposite. They haven't got the 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 temperature in into them there. Okay, this is a bit of a weird question, but have you ever sat there and looked at your strategy and then just gone to the race engineer and said, look, if we can bluff the other team into pitting now, it's going to give us a huge advantage. Do what you can. Or is that just something that occasionally happens on the pit wall? Yeah, so I think it is okay. I think you'll you'll always look at this situation to be kind of say, right, we're in we're in a quite a good place here, and it's a it's a one of two things. We'll have a pit now and gain the undercut or overcut potentially, um, depending on, or they'll stop. But we know we've got a bit of pace, and we can kind of keep going with on with it. So that's often where you hit, sometimes you hear those opposite calls. You say, "Oh, I, I want I want the other I want the other car to pit actually," or uh, I say, "Or oh, if the other car doesn't pit, great, we're in free air. I've actually been held up by him, so now I've got a bit of chance to offset my strategy." If I just pitted at the same time with him, I might have got the. If I'd pitted, I'd have got the undercut. Great, but sometimes there's maybe a, a a a part. There's a few cars you need to overtake, and you're not quite happy doing that. Or you're trying. You know, maybe on the edge of the tires on the window, you want to go that bit longer. But you know, other teams are on that one, so you will try and maybe force them in in that same bit. So you'll be potentially talking about pitting, where actually you've got no interest of pitting in that initial stage because it's too early but you get people thinking and then they they may react anyway um but you'll you'll balance the kind of risk and reward of that one but potentially go right if i do pit here even though it's not slightly optimum i'm not going to lose anything out here however if they do pit we can maybe take advantage of this especially if there's a safety car or something along those those lines right i knew this would happen i knew this would happen mike because your, your your head is always so like detailed that i was like right if we if we set out like four or five detailed 101 questions and then three race scenarios that we can present to mike uh that will be the show but really we didn't get past spa and lots of other interesting things came out of it so no that that's fantastic because we had loads of other things we wanted to to ask you as well about like what was going on in the um in the silverstone race with the interchangeable weather perhaps a little bit of the the psychology and the hierarchy with the the mclaren stuff and so we'll have to get you on in the next uh, couple of weeks to see if you did indeed have magical FP2 predictive powers um, as well. Uh, so I want to leave this on a one question, one final question, because we were talking about Spa. Russell ended up getting disqualified for being too light. Whose fault was it? Uh, nobody seems to have asked that. And obviously, I'm not going to start naming team members individual, individually, but whose fault was that? I mean, I have no idea. <laughs> it's, 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 I'm, I'm going to say one thing is I don't, obviously the one stop may have had a slight, slight impact on it, but it's not, I saw a lot of it, it's like coming out of saying definitely the one stop were causing to be underweight. It's, like, it's not, it wasn't, it's, it's more so like 
you have a you have a liter and you have a kilo and a half of drinks potentially in the car and it's like and does that um, count yeah that counts yeah oh yeah you can have that that's part of the weight of the car that's that's fine but, yeah, but maybe he doesn't maybe he drinks, maybe he decided not to, uh, to, to add the, the drinks to drinks and maybe that was an oversight i don't know as i like, maybe there was a a leak somewhere which has caused some 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 of the oil um to to kind of not be present in the car maybe yeah i mean i heard he lost a lot of weight more than expected which Maybe they just forgot to fit a piece of ballast. It's 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 it can be easily done. They might have lost a wheel weight on one of the cars. You, 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 there's lots of things that they might already know and probably do already know, but there's no direct fault for. But it's just it just happens. I think he knows. Okay, I just think he knows. Tiny, <laughs> tiny factual follow up to that. Uh, everybody noted that there's no real in lap at Spa. And I just wanted to ask, do you know an actual figure for like how much weight a car might pick up uh, doing the pickup on the end on a normal in lap with the hot tires and trying to pick up all the all the rubber that's been shredded earlier in the race? Do you I know how much they can it, gain about? I think it's about 300, 400 grams. Not per tire. Oh, OK, so not that much. No, um, so not really that much then. No, no. Um, and also, the, part of the regulations is that the FIA can weigh it on a different set of tyres. If they think there's the excessive pickup on the tyres, the FIA can weigh the cars on a separate set of tyres. Mm. So you have to build in some, some margin. So at some point, someone yeah. has to decide, right, how safe are we going to play this whole weight thing? Yeah. No, no, the, I mean, mm. it's throughout the whole weekend. You'll look at, like, from, again, back to practice sessions. From practice sessions, you'll be looking at what your consumption is. You'll be looking at what... Um, uh yeah what what kind of the weight of the driver is all your ballasts and and making sure you're you're getting in these windows and you should apply some margin to it you'll i think it's very rare that any car will ever come in like right on the nose but obviously like george did which makes me so su like surprised and it's something like that i i my guess is that it's something that was missing from the car which should have been on the car not and then it was a combination of a few other things which like meant it was just that 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 margin had gone but like um, i fully believe their sheets would have said yeah he was coming in with yeah a kilo kilo spare there that that was fine hmm. okay we're gonna have to roll the tape back because when i asked whose fault it is I've, i need to reanalyze the smile that came across mike's face because i've got a feeling like it's my his mate derek or something's like oh no i can't i can't drop derek in it now i'll, I'll just say it could be anything uh, but mike thank you so much for your time is your twitter account i know you, you flick between private and uh, and public mike caulfield on twitter are you gonna come out of the shadows i think it's public at the moment is it okay well, good so, yeah and then i mean I've, then... I've not been on it recently because it's, it's shut down so it's like nothing to nothing to talk about summer holiday yeah. yeah no i've been very good at shutting down over the holiday normally i can't switch off but i was i was very very relaxed over the summer but mike if we can get you back on sometime after monza and catch up on all this uh uh, this this con this great content that Matt prepared that we didn't even get close to that would be fantastic. Mike, uh, former chief strategist at Haas and strategist at Mercedes, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, cheers, guys. And that's all from me and Matt for this week. We will see you around 8 p.m. for our Zandvoort Dutch Grand Prix race review. And then, of course, for 8 p.m. for Monza as well. In the middle of the week, we're going to have a really, really exciting interview with someone who's driven an F1 car. So that'll be nice. And until we see you next, work hard, be kind. You and <laughs> work hard, be kind, and have fun. This was Missed Apex Podcast. There's too many buttons, Steve.